Hello, everybody. My name is Tom Folks. I, my company is called Mightycom, and we have actually three of Mightycom's clients on the panel. Uh, we, we represent the Diesel Technology Forum in Sacramento. We represent Volvo Group in California, and uh, we have been with Neste uh, since 2006 when they first came to California with a gleam in their eye and an idea. And so what I would like to do is follow up on some of the presentations that you saw today. Uh, in, in doing that, I, I would kind of like, if you don't mind, set the table for this discussion, if it's okay with you guys. And in my world, in, in the policy world of, of Sacramento, uh, it, there are lots of problems that the state's trying to deal with. And w w when it comes to vehicles and fuels, the state, sort of in fits and starts has treated the problem and their approach to the problem as a system. So even though the regulations that they promulgate aren't necessarily in tandem, what you end up with, the, the final product, is a systems approach to greenhouse gas reduction and NOx reduction. And so when it comes to the vehicle approach to greenhouse gas reduction and NOx reduction, a a Alan already covered that. There is a thing called the fleet truck and bus rule in California, which requires owners of uh, fleets of a certain size to, pr to turn over their vehicles to 2010 model year or newer equipment. And these, there's certain milestones that have to be done. So by 2023, the entire fleet of heavy duty vehicles in California must be 2010 emissions compliant or newer. That simply means everything has to have an SCR system on it to deal with NOx. And then, on the fuel side, there's the low carbon fuel standard, and Alan did touch on it. We've all been sort of dancing around it. The low carbon fuel standard, I'm sure most of you know, by 2020, all liquid transportation fuels, I should say all transportation fuels, need to have carbon reductions of 10% by 2020. Now there's, there is, uh, it has been announced by the Air Resources Board that by 2030, that content will be up to 18% carbon reduction out of fuels. So having said that, have, have sort of set the table, Marku, what I would like to do is ask you, in your research of emissions, technology, and fuels in Europe primarily, I'm curious if you have found any distinction in particulate matter output between diesel engines uh, that you looked at and gasoline engines you looked at. And, and let's just stick to light duty passenger vehicles for now. Uh, is, there, is there a difference in just the emissions profile between diesel and gasoline? Yeah, there definitely is, is a dif difference with, with, with all the diesel vehicles nowadays, uh, equipment with, uh, with uh, diesel particulate filters, with, which are very efficient, and with, with, uh, uh, with renewable diesel, they, they, they stay alive a long, long time, but the technical technological development has gone to the direction where the direct injection gasoline engines emits more particulates than, than the clean diesels nowadays. So there is a difference uh, in, in, the, in the emissions on the, on the fine particulates and ultra fine particulates. Right. And so on some light duty passenger vehicles that have gasoline direct injection engines, yep. there, that is where there is some discussion about perhaps those vehicles ought to have PM filters the same way so that they can be as clean as diesel. Yep. Um, so, okay, Th thanks for answering that question. Jeremy earlier had a slide up and it was, he went by it really quickly and it was a, the, the first Phil slide. It was a photo of, of, a, of Mary Nichols, who's the chairwoman of the Air Resources Board, filling up a diesel vehicle with uh, Nestle's product at a Propel fueling station. That is a significant photo because it shows the heft and the policy power that renewable diesel fuel has within the regulatory framework of California. So if you were to look at the low carbon fuel standard and you were to look at all the compliance fuels that come into play into California within that policy framework, just pretend it's a pie chart. And if you take a look at the pie chart, you cut it in half, about half of the fuels that come into compliance for the LCFS are ethanol for gasoline, because that's where we have a lot of the fuel use. And then over on the other side of the pie chart, it's cut up into various pieces. Natural gas has got a, a slice, electric drive has got a smaller slice, 
And then there's biodiesel, which has about a 12% piece of the pie. And then there's renewable diesel, which I think is now 18 to 20%. So in terms of the state's ability to comply with the low carbon fuel standard on the diesel side, renewable diesel now is an essential ingredient into the state's overall compliance with the low carbon fuel standard. So given all of that background, Alan, I'm just picking up on what you said, and this goes to Greg as well, whichever one of you wants to deal with this. Moving forward, you know, you said diesel is going to be alive. Where do you think we're going to end up at the end of greenhouse gas two regulation at the federal level, at the truck and bus rule uh, at the state level? Where is diesel going to end up at, at, at some point in terms of the workload and the ability to carry freight and all those sorts of things? Kind of a vague question, but go for it. Sure. Um, well, I, as I alluded on one of the slides there, I think you know, we're getting smarter about what we're doing. So when you start to combine some of these um, new attributes together, you really get a multiplier effect. So a great example is what happens when you introduce a little bit of hybridization into a medium duty truck. Um, if that works well, then you can downsize the diesel engine. So now you've got a smaller displacement engine that's um, supported with hybridization in the powertrain. And now, then if you add a renewable fuel component to that, now you've got a threefer. So you've got a very efficient technology without fundamentally changing the infrastructure of fuels and everybody's investments that are already made. And you've got something that can work for um, the owner of that vehicle. Same kind of thing goes for off-road machines and equipment um, even more. So I think, you know, the future is about, you know, using, the, using fuels and technology in a smarter way and a more specific way than we have in the past. And you know, you're starting to see, um, uh, certainly out here where we have a lot of interest in, in green technology. Uh, for example, and I'll, I'll mention the high-speed rail line, and, and hopefully nobody will throw anything at me, but we like to use that in Washington as an example of an infrastructure project um, for better or for worse, but one of the things that that project is contingent on is using the most advanced uh, clean construction technology. So all the, the, the um, excavators and those kind of machines are, are tier four um, new generation clean diesel technology. And the locomotives, uh, uh, any of the diesel locomotives would be that generation as well. So you have you know, these, these relationships of, of construction and green construction with environmental uh, sensibility and footprint. So, you know, renewable fuels could be a very big part of that to help achieve uh, goals, not only in the operation of things, but also in the building of things. So we see that on some basic construction projects. I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see that start to come into play as we think about infrastructure more as a nation, that, you know, there might be incentives there for people to, um, uh, to help be part of infrastructure development, especially if they use a cleaner fuel or a more advanced technology if it's available. Uh, yeah, to, to touch on something from Marco's uh, presentation, uh, what we haven't done is uh, this co-development like you were talking about. Um, today, in D975, the minimum spec for cetane is, is uh, 40, and uh, in Europe it's much higher than that, of course. Um, so we have to design the engines to work on that fuel. Now, if we had a co-development in the future, where we could ch take advantage of the high cetane uh, in the renewable diesel at 60, 70 uh, cetane, uh, we might, we should be able to, uh, to take advantage of that and lower uh, emissions even more. But I did want to comment on the certification end of things because you got light duty certification at EPA and you've got, you know, a, California has its own certification process too. I, it's not a question, but it, perhaps, Greg, you'd like to address it if you've heard about this inside the company. And that is that the relationship between truck makers, automakers, and the regulatory end of things that, you know, that, that everything has to go through a certification process. That process has been stressed in the, in the trust between the regulatory world and the in the the OEM world has been strained. Greg, is there anything you can share with us within Volvo that addresses that dynamic? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not on that emission side, but uh, we all work closely together. And uh, since that, uh, certainly the aspect of OBD, which is very very complicated, um, the time to get certification has significantly increased. 
uh, that gap between when you apply and when you're going to get it, uh, some cases have doubled in time. So we're, there were a couple of our uh, uh, engines that were literally approved at the last minute, even though we thought we were three months ahead of that. So there has been an impact, no question about it. Yeah, and I have heard that there are not just one, but several OEMs that has been a threat to the production line in terms of the ability to get these products into the dealerships because the certification has come so late in the game.